I like working for people who see me as a professional. And the non-lenders see you as a professional, not as somebody to give you a piece of paper. They don't see, the AMCs particularly see you as all the same. Just like, you know, one certificate is one, one appraiser is better than another. But the non-lender people see you as a professional. Originating from deep inside the Rocky Mountains, transported through the power of the internet, and arriving inside your tiny earbuds, it's the Appraiser Coach Podcast, helping appraisers increase their efficiency, quality, and make more money. Here's the guy who makes it his life's mission to create value for real estate appraisers nationwide. Your host and the appraiser coach, Dustin Harris. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the program, everybody. Dustin Harris hanging out once again with you in the podcast here. Thank you for joining me. Uh, got a great guest coming up. Want to remind you that we are sponsored by Data Master. Data Master, of course, is the way to save 30 to 60 minutes per report. That's per report, folks, not per day, not per week, not per month, per report. Do the math. Datamasterusa.com is where you find them, datamasterusa.com. We, of course, are sponsored by OREP Insurance. OREP is the insurance E&O that I use. Uh, you should be as well. Check them out. Go to OREP.org. That's O-R-E-P dot org. And finally, sponsored, of course, by Alamode. Alamode is the uh, software that I've been using for years and years and years. They continue to save me time, make me more efficient, and, of course, that makes me more money. Check them out. Go to alamode.com or call them at 800 all the mode. Well, folks, uh, welcome back to the program. This is, boy, it's been a while since uh, since I've had her on. Uh, she used to be a regular, uh, and I guess we could still call you regular Ann O'Rourke. Welcome back to the program. I'm glad to be here again. It's it's always good to have you, a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, I won't bother with the story because people, uh, long listeners to, to this program know the story of how you and I met years ago. Uh, we'll just uh, boil it down. I met you at a conference and uh, super impressed with your uh, journalism skills and running around and interviewing and talking to everybody. And uh, uh, just real quick for the uh, listeners, just a reminder, you are in Alameda, California. Uh, you've been an appraiser since 1975. I don't even want to tell you what what uh, what year I was born in. Um, you uh, you worked at an assessor's office first, and then uh, started your appraisal office in 1986. You're both residential and commercial. You are an MAI, but most importantly for us, you are the author of Appraisal Today. I know a lot of my listeners uh, take Appraisal Today, both the free and the uh, and the paid version. And we're going to be talking a little bit about the paid version today. Uh, we're going to be talking about non lender. That's kind of where you started, right, Ann? Um, let me give you a little bit of a background. It's probably unusual for many of your listeners. I um, started my appraisal business in 1986. I had never seen a Fannie Mae form, <laughs> and so uh, so I wasn't. Partic- and so I said, "Well, all these people are calling me, insurance companies, people like that. Okay, let's go for it and do it." But what happened when I started my business in '86 is it was we were just recovering from probably the worst appraisal. Ex- recession that ever existed mm. in uh, in the early 80s interest rates were at 18 oh, percent so yeah. basically there was no appraisal work lender work mm. so anyway i started my business and that's how i happened to do the non-lender work because it was all new to me right and also my orientation uh i got an mba in 1980 and what happens when you get an mba is i think it's like a law degree or something I look at everything from the point of view of business. Sometimes I like to turn it off, but it's like I'm looking at a store. How do they run the business? How's the cash register? It's just kind of weird. But anyway, that's my orientation. So you, uh, I, I find this interesting because we're kind of we're kind of on the flip side of that. It kind of, we can almost bookend this. You get in to the appraisal world when there's really not a ton of lender work going on. I know a lot of appraisers right now are concerned that uh, that lender work, and some of them, that's all they've ever known. Let's just put that out there. But some of that lender work is starting to uh, dissipate or change. You know, we see the hybrids, we see the bifurcated reports. A lot of appraisers are now uh, moving toward non-lender work. So you come from this from a from a perspective, I think, that is uh, very unique in the sense that that's where you started. What would you say to an appraiser who's moving that direction now? Okay, the first thing I would say is get a website 
and have somebody do your website who understands how to set it up so that you can get leads. Because if you look at my website, appraisalady.com, the whole website's about my publishing. Hmm. In the upper right corner, I have my tagline was looking for an appraiser for a state trust in Alameda, California, contact us. What happened is I, of course, advertised in Yellow Pages. So over the years, I realized that the only stuff I got that was any good except for the people that I don't know what they want. You know, I need an appraisal for something and they don't know anything. I didn't want them. Hmm. Um, so, so I put that, that's the only thing I have on my website. Half my business is from my website. I don't have to do anything. Interesting. Yeah. I'm sad. So that would be first. And then the second thing is the primary source for residential appraisers uh, is referrals from real estate agents hmm. and every single real estate agent you call you communicate with, you meet in a meeting, I go on tour every week, you tell them you're available for non-lender work. And believe me, if I did divorce appraisals, I would be swamped. I quit doing divorces a while ago. It wasn't for me, but I get a lot of, that's how I get a lot of referrals. So that would be the one and the two things I would say. Okay. The two easiest things you can do. So I mentioned. Don't even have to talk to, don't even have to, talk to anybody if you have a website. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's and there's probably a lot that can be done to uh, to drive business to that website, of course. And we've talked about that here on this program yeah. before. We of course talk about it in my All Star Team and my uh, other membership areas. Let's talk about your membership area because that really sets up the conversation today. I talked about the free newsletter that you put out to uh, to thousands of appraisers. Uh, I think what it comes out once a once a month. The uh, or actually more than that, a couple times a month. The appraisal today, the free newsletter. But talk to us about the paid newsletter. What's that all about, Ann? The free newsletter comes out once a week. Uh, I've been sending it out since 1994, wow. almost every week, every week now. And that's supported by paid advertisers. And that's 17000 on that list. And then I started my um, – the reason I started my paid newsletter in 1992 was I wanted to kind of have something different. You're never going to believe this. I took bonehead English in college. Who's to know I'm going to end up? I just wanted to have something different, a, a diversification. And I, I had the MBA, so I knew a lot about business. And so um, that's what happened with those. And then the paid, um, it's under a thousand. What happens with the paid newsletter, like the other vendors, um, I make most of my money. I peaked at about 1500 during in the 2000s. And then I lost almost half. I've been, this is not my first down slide. Mm -hmm, and sure. so I, I get most of my new, most of my people, as does most people, you probably too, when new appraisers come into the business, but there haven't been any new residential appraisers. So it's pretty hard, you know, I'm keeping steady, but it's tough. It's you know changing. I mean. That's changing. Um, and, and I'm glad you set it up that way because uh, the free newsletter is great information, obviously, but the paid newsletter, yeah. of course, goes into goes into in-depth information. Uh, specifically, uh, today we're talking about your April 2019 article um, on non-lender work and non-lender communication. Why did you Why did you write that article, Ann? You know, I've been, I've been writing about non-lender work since I started in 1992, and um, I just kept thinking I was missing something. What I do is I'll maybe be driving down the – that's like an appraiser. You're driving down the freeway, you're watching TV, you somehow come come up with an idea for your appraisals. Or Wait a second. Did you say you're watching TV on the freeway? And Or somebody – or some, oh, I have a big pad. I just write it, write a little <laughs> okay. note or something. And then other people, somebody will call me on the phone or send me an email when it gives me an idea. And so this article was, was hard because what happened was there's so many different kinds of non-lender work. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, we'll just move ahead. What happened? Anyway, that's what happened. And I started, and also I've done so much of it with so many different types of clients. Um, it's a lot easier to write something you know than to have to interview everybody in the world mm. to get it done. So that's another reason that I've been writing about all these. And when I write an article, say I'm writing an article on tax appeal, I do write about how to contact them and all that other stuff. But this is like the big picture of non-lender work right. about how it was – I never really thought about it until I looked at it. Then when you put lender versus non-lender side by side, they're dramatically different in their communication. What it does is I kind of, I kind of, all these ideas I had finally came together in this article. I don't know why nobody else has written about it, but 
I wish I would have had this article when I started my business in 1986. It would have made it a lot easier. Yeah, your focus in this article, I mean, obviously you talk about non-lender work, and, and you've already shared a couple of ideas on how to get that non-lender work. But the, the gist or the main thrust of this article seems to be about the communication. I want to set this up by by saying my clients right now, those individuals that I'm mentoring, whether it be my mastermind or my appraiser academy or the one-on-one coaching that I'm doing, many appraisers across the nation, and this won't come as a surprise to you, are moving or at least saying <laughs> that they're moving in the non-lender uh, arena, but many of them are not doing much about it. And I think it's important – I talk about the non-lender trade-off. Uh, because there is a trade-off there. I don't think you can yep. really, truly jump into this world uh, of non-lender without spending some time and without spending some money in advertising, in in standing up in front of groups of, of realtors. I mean, you talked about having a website. That's really step one, but you've got to drive traffic to that website. And in doing so, it's there's a whole lot that goes into that. But more importantly... And this is really the gist of the article, I think, is is it's very different than lender work in the sense, let's talk about communication. What's the main difference between lender, say a 1004 Fannie Mae, and maybe a GPAR that you're doing for, well, you brought it up, a divorce a divorce situation? I did have a few comments on this. Please. Um, been around for a while. And this is, in my newsletter, there are cyclical topics. When everybody's business is slow, everybody wants to know about non lender work. Yes. When everybody's busy, they want to know about uh, production, getting stuff faster and stuff like that. That's, that's just the way it is. And so now I get to write about it again. It's nice. <laughs> I forgot. What was your question? Uh, uh, communication, specifically the, the gist or the title of the article, talking about non lender communication. What's the difference between, say, working with a Fannie Mae situation versus a non lender GPAR? A general purpose appraisal report. Okay, I have a I have a list, and I wrote this down. Let's take a few samples here. Date of inspection, lender. I mean, effective date, lender. Date of inspection, non-lender. Current, past, future can be anything. Mm-hmm. And the number of dates, lender one, non-lender. It can be multiple, multiple dates. When the person died, when the previous person died, and for divorce, when they separated. It's really hard to find this information out. And you have um, the turn time, the lender decides, you decide. Sometimes I, I've had stuff that was nine, ten months, you know. Uh, type of value, market value, you decide the value. Uh, type of report, the lender defines, you decide. Drive by, well, you, you don't you, you use the GPAR form or the others. You don't use the lender forms for that. But you decide, is it a drive by, is it a restricted, now that we can do restricted. You know, and uh, certification limit conditions, I make mine up every time. I change it. Engagement letters from the lender, you do your own engagement letter. So it's like the list is huge. Mm -hmm. Uh, The use of the appraisal, mortgage lending for lending, it it can be anything to use. And how to communicate the report, the lender tells you what to do. They've got 30 pages of things that they want. You have to match your report to the client. I mean, so I was talking to somebody the other day. She says, yeah, she does a lot of divorce. And, and they come in there with these UAD forms and all the UAD stuff on the forms. Well, they judge just throws them out. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of a summary of all the, all the difficult. The other one is, well, it's just different. Well, when, certain time, when, different. When, but when, some are the same. Sometimes they're the same. They yeah, call you on the phone. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, you you get a phone call know. from a borrower in a lender situation, and I think most appraisers kind of freak out. By the way, they don't need to. We can certainly talk to borrowers, um, but we do kind of freak out a little <laughs> bit because you know where this is going to go. Is there's going to be some coercion here? And many appraisers have put in place that uh, you know they just won't talk to to borrowers without written permission from the from the client. But um, in this situation, you're typically the phone call comes from the client. The client is the person living in the home or getting a divorce or challenging their taxes and you can right. you can talk to them and how do they get your name well with lenders they get it off an appraiser list mm-hmm. i mean they can get your name anywhere and right. so well that's the other issue i discussed of professional and others um we'll go over that later but i just wanted to let my readers know that it's not that hard you're doing a bankruptcy appraisal it's the same as an, it's an appraisal and you might have to go and it's a judge and it's no problem or assess an appeal, you know, 
but um, some of this stuff can get kind of tricky. We're talking with Anna O'Rourke of Appraisal Today. Uh, she's talking to us about non-lender, specifically communication and uh, and how it is different than when you're in the lender field. Uh, can't wait to talk more with her, and uh, I know she's got some more to share. I want to pause here, of course, to remind you that we are sponsored by Data Master. Data Master is what I use to save about 45 minutes per report. Now, you might think that that's a lot, and maybe I'm exaggerating, but folks, I'm kind of geeky this way that I actually have a stopwatch and I use it. Uh, on occasion to uh, to just track things. In fact, I've got a big list. I call it the appraisal assembly line, and every step of the appraisal process is broken down into tasks and tier one, tier two, tier three, and how much time it takes me to do those things. There are several tasks on that list, including the MC sheet, including fill in, uh, filling in the form, the data entry, uh, downloading comps, uh, that Data Master takes care of for me with a punch of a button. It adds up, folks, and it adds up on every single appraisal that I do. Folks, if you're trying to streamline and become more efficient as we move into the busy season, check them out. Go to datamasterusa.com and find out what Data Master can do for you. Speaking of doing for you, a la mode, of course, is the software that I've been using for years and years and years, and there's a reason, folks. I've looked at the cost, I've looked at the investment, and I've looked at the time savings, and I've looked at the tools that a la mode gives me the ability to be able to do the side by side, the smart adjust, uh, the ability to reuse phrases that I've used in the past, to do quick lists and the mobile and everything. I could go on and on. Folks, there's a reason that I continue to send a little money to a la mode. They continue to save me multiple time on every report that I do. Check them out. Go to alamode.com if you're using any other software. Uh, find out how they're different. In fact, pick up the phone and call them and ask them. Say, hey, I'm using XYZ. How are you different? And their salespeople will be able to tell you that. Again, it's alamode.com or 800 alamode. Finally, we are sponsored by OREP Insurance. Folks, about four years ago, give or take, I sometimes, uh, I, I sometimes, I think it's about four years ago, so I've been doing this podcast about four years, but sometimes I mix up the timeline. About four years ago, I switched over to uh, OREP from another, uh, from another uh, insurance carrier and uh, didn't think much of it other than it was very easy to do so. The next year, I saved money, and I've saved money every single year that I've renewed. In fact, this last year, I added an appraiser and saved $100 over what I paid last year. I know it doesn't make any sense to me either. But that's the kind of company that OREP is. They're a broker, and they will shop around and get you the best price and the best coverage. If you're with anyone else, check them out. Go to OREP.org. That's O-R-E-P dot org. And welcome back to the program, everybody. Talking with Anna O'Rourke of Appraisal Today. Today, we're specifically talking about an article that Anne wrote and that ran in her paid newsletter for April 2019. And the uh, article, the main article, and this is a couple of pages long, so there's a lot of information here. We only have time to go over a little bit of it today. But it has to do with non-lender work and specifically non-lender communication. Uh, and as you categorize them into professional and non-professional non-lender work, uh, what's the difference between a professional non-lender and a non-professional non-lender appraisal? Yes, this um, I actually had lunch with John Rusting, and he's the one that got me to say, to understand this because the article was not coming together. What you have a professional, it, a, a professional would be someone who knows about appraisals and orders them. Hmm. Attorneys, relocation companies, insurance companies, all those kinds of people. And they're pretty straightforward. You know, sometimes they change over time and, you know, it's not too hard, not a lot of, well, up front is pretty straightforward when you get into it, especially with attorneys, it goes off of never, never land. But <laughs> initial, the initial contact and the orientation, they know what appraisals look like. Sure. So the other people tend to be um, probably the two categories for that. They um, they 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 don't send you a form that's already filled out. So you're trying to figure out who's the client, who's involved. You have to get kind of the backstory 
You know the ones that call you on the phone and I need an appraisal? <laughs> okay. That's that's the non-professional side, those. right? Yeah, okay, sure. we all get those. Uh, those seldom result in an appraisal, uh, an appraisal but, um, you know, you say, why do you need an appraisal? Oh, I'm going to sell my house. And I don't do pre-listing appraisals, but if I did, I would try to sell them that. Uh -huh. But I would say, um, I suggest you contact a local real estate agent our market so, was so volatile here in the Bay Area. Contact a local real estate agent. If you don't know about it, I can give you a couple of names. Another reason for them to get my name out, I give their name on referral, but they don't ever help me out. I don't help them. Help them you know? <laughs> right. We're so mean. We're so mean, the appraisers. Well, so, um, you know, that's the difference. And the estate people, I mean, how often do you handle an estate? I never do it myself. I would say no, ever be a trustee. And so they've got all these issues, the date of death, and sometimes you have a couple of dates, and um, and they've never done it before, and they're totally stressed out sure. because somebody died, and everybody's pointing the finger at them saying, when am I getting my money? Right. In that case, here in the Bay Area, it's the attorneys some time ago said that the executor has to order the appraisals and pay for them. I'm not sure why. and Or let's say someone – is getting a divorce and calls you anyway. It's 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 like a lot of kind of I call it backstory, figuring out what's happening, who's doing what. You know what I mean? You've done this, mm -hmm. sure. Well, and yeah. that and that really is the gist of the article. Here is you've got to understand your audience. You've got to understand the yeah. reader, the user, the intended user on the report because it does make a difference. As you mentioned, I and I've seen this as well. I've reviewed. I don't do a lot of reviews, Anne, but every once in a while I do, and I've reviewed. Uh, well, I've told the story before standing, I was, I was on the stand and there was another appraisal done for the other side. And the appraisal was presented to me on the stand for my quote unquote opinion. Okay. There's a lot that would go into that as well. And so there was a little bit of wrangling back and forth between me and the uh, attorney. But what was interesting is this other appraisal was done on a URAR form. Now this was before UAD. But the, it was done on a Fannie Mae form, and it was for a divorce. The, pro, the But the problem is, is those forms specifically talk about mortgage. They specifically talk about the lending side. And, and by the way, that part cannot be changed. And so if you're using a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac form, you're specifically talking language uh, that is, that is uh, concerning a, uh, uh, you know, a mortgage situation. Uh, now, a, a GPAR, and you pointed this out as well, a GPAR could be used, but are we, are we throwing in C3? Are we throwing in 1.1 bath? Uh, it's something that, that our users may not understand. And we understand that. We do it all the time if we're in that lender field. But we've got – if we're going to get into this non-lender side of things, and more and more appraisers are, I think your article makes some really good points that you've got to be really careful about how you communicate, not just in the report, but after the fact when they call you on the phone. They've got to be able to understand. You, I mean, have, to, you have to erase from your mind everything you know about lender reporting – lender report types, and how you handle the client. So it's like a complete mind wipe on, mind wipe on something. Now, today, you would never use a mortgage form because you would be beat up by the other side. You know, just to let you know, that's the main reason. And that's I do have one more thing I want to say. Please. The hardest time to market non-lender work is when everybody else is doing it. <laughs> the easiest time yeah. is when nobody's doing it. Yeah, and dig, dig let me well. give you the bottom line on this. If you want to succeed in lender work, you have to turn down lender work sometimes. Hmm. So if you want to so succeed, I love this. It. If you want to succeed in the non-lender world, you're going to have to turn down some lender work because you've got to focus on that other side. Takes time. Right. I have always done that, but most people, they just uh, only want to do, you get your clients established and everybody knows you and you've got your referral system and then they call you with, with an assignment mm -hmm. and you've got these lender jobs. Also, on the, on the other hand, though, the non-lender stuff, it's much easier to, you know, I tell them to turn around, month, two months, whatever. So, but you do have to fit them in. What are uh, what, your lender work. what are the upsides in your mind as we close out here, Ann? What are the upsides in working in the non-lender world? Why would an appraiser want to move in that direction? Uh, the main reason for residential, for myself, is even when I used to do a non-lender work, 
Um, I had a base of work that I would have with it when there was no lender work at all. Left. So you have, I wanted to feel secure because I quit doing long lender work. It was too cyclical. But, you know, before that, when I got it built up, so you get out of that. And the other is um, I did not, I like working for people who see me as a professional. And the non-lenders see you as a professional, not as somebody to give you a piece of paper. For, they don't see, the AMCs particularly see you as all the same. Just like, you know, one certificate is one, one appraisal is better than another. But the non-lender people see you as a professional. Wouldn't you say that? I think so. I think it depends on who you're dealing with. But yeah, I think in general, your your comment is spot on. And, I, you know, it can be very rewarding. Me. It can be very rewarding to... Uh, uh, to deal with that side as well. I know you mentioned that, you know, some people won't do divorce work because there's so much drama involved there. Some people won't do mm-hmm. estate work for the same reason. As you mentioned, you know, it's right. a very difficult, challenging time. Uh, I'm currently involved in an estate situation with a partial interest appraisal. In fact, when I get done with you today, uh, I'm meeting with another professional, uh, another highly respected appraiser uh, who's helping me through this process. I've employed his uh, his knowledge because this one's a challenging and difficult one. But I'll tell you, it's very rewarding to go through that process and help individuals make life altering financial decisions based on the knowledge and expertise that you put into this. It can be a great, it can be a great thing for everybody. I think probably because I started at the assessor's office and it, I guess got a totally different orientation. And when I started lending work, I said, what? They're telling me what to do? Who are these people? <laughs> right? So I think where you start appraising is important because yeah. my job, I was given like, it was Northern California, kind of rural. You were given a whole area, you appraised everything in it, whatever it was, you had to do the highest and best use and everything. And um, my job was to equalize property tax assessments. So I was doing, so to speak, public good. And uh, uh, lenders, okay, it helps people get a loan. But the non-lender stuff is, I think you're right, it's kind of more personal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of, maybe, maybe. Well, that's, that's more personal if it's dealing with uh, the non-professionals, particularly the professionals, relocation company, you know, you know what I mean. Insurance companies, stuff like that. So I would say, um, and the fees are quite a bit higher. I charge um, I charge 50% more than the typical house fee here, and no one ever says no. No, I, I absolutely. I talked. I talked about uh, uh, the assignment that I'm working on right now. I'll just. I'll just throw out the fee. I'll tell you what it is, just because I think it's important for appraisers to understand that uh, you know this is a different world. You're not dealing with bids coming over from AMCs. No. You're dealing with a specific situation. No. And as I assessed the situation. As I looked at the situation, I knew that I would be employing the uh, the work uh, of somebody else, um, the knowledge and the expertise of somebody else. Uh, I bid eighteen hundred dollars, and guess what? I got it. Um, and and people are are willing to pay f- to get a professional opinion so that they can make these big decisions. And so yeah, you can. Uh, there's a lot of upsides to doing non non lender work. And uh, I would say that anyone who is interested in moving in that direction needs to go to appraisal today, sign up for the paid newsletter. You can get, I know this is going to air after, of course, your, uh, your article is dropped. Um, and, uh, but you can get the past issues as well, right, Ann? Uh, actually, you can get them all the way back to 1992 if well, you, you really go. want them. I have them all. There you go. So, folks, if you're interested in doing non-lender work, uh, it's appraisaltoday.com. Is that right, Ann? That's it. Sign up for the paid newsletter. You should already be getting the free newsletter for sure. Um, but uh, consider uh, signing up for her paid newsletter and go back to April 2019 and read the article, the very uh, highly researched and articulate article on communication with non-lender. And thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me back. I enjoyed it. Always a pleasure. I uh, love Ann. I love having her on the program. Appreciate her making time. Again, folks, it's appraisaltoday.com. Uh, at least sign up for the free newsletter. If not, uh, uh, consider the uh, the paid newsletter. Great information there once a month. It's very detailed, very long, very well-researched uh, information that will help you to be a better appraiser. Uh, thank you for joining me today, folks, and we will catch you next time. You've been listening to the Appraiser Coach Podcast with Dustin Harris. If you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and post a short review on iTunes. 
for more in-depth insider information on how you can make more money as a real estate appraiser, visit theappraisercoach.com and sign up for the All-Star Team today. Thanks for joining us. And now, get out there and create some value. Um, let, give me just a second. Well, I, we're yes, yeah, we're connected so far, but give me a give me a second because I need to. Okay, give give me a test one two three on your side. One two three. Oh hell! Hold on a second. No, give me just a second to figure out what's why why that is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I dialed in from my phone, which is what I did last week, but it- that worked. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. All right, here we go. I'm putting you on mute now so we can dive in. And uh, we're talking with Anna Rourke. Uh, we're going to be talking about non-lender communication in three, two, one. <laughs> 